So if you're a traditional Jew that wasn't fulfilled by Yeshua, then what happened? I don't want to press the issue too much, but this isn't our Bible, isn't it? Again, I've had traditional Jews tell me that there were Messianic prophecies that were supposed to be fulfilled before the Second Temple was destroyed, and they weren't because of our sin and disobedience. No, the right way to understand it is if God said it would happen, it's going to happen. But perhaps because of our sin and disobedience, we missed it. Rather than saying that what God promised would happen didn't happen. And when God gave a timetable in which it would happen, it didn't happen. And if, and if it had to happen before the second temple was destroyed, not just any temple, but that second temple, if it didn't happen within that time frame, it will never happen. So if Yeshua didn't fulfill these, then please, pray tell, explain how these should be interpreted. So here are the, the six items. And uh, I'll lay out for you a, a translation and interpretation of a conservative Christian scholar, James E. Smith. Number one, to fill up or restrain the transgression. Within the 490-year period, the people of Israel would commit their final transgression against God. Jesus indicated that the leaders of his generation were about to fill up the measure of the sin of their forefathers. Interesting. In other words, the final great national act of sin committed by our people. We, we sin with the golden calf. We sin during the exodus, uh, during the wilderness wanderings. We sinned in the days of Saul and David and Solomon. We sinned in the days of different kings. We rejected different prophets, but then we filled up our transgression by rejecting the Messiah. Oh, God did not cast us off as his people. God did not say I'm through with you forever, but that was the filling up of our transgression. That, that makes perfect sense. And that's why there was such a harsh judgment. That's why the temple was destroyed and there was so much suffering because our leaders failed to embrace Messiah when he came, when he came and offered peace, when he came and offered blessing. It, it, look at it like this. Look at it like this. If, if I say, this building is going to go up in smoke, I'm telling you, there's a gas line leak. It's, it's this, this building is going to ignite. we got to get out of here. Run. We've got a place of safety just a half mile down the road. we got vans ready to take you over. Run. If we don't and the building blows up, we were warned. Yeshua wept over Jerusalem, Luke 19. He said, if you only understood the things that belong to your peace, all this is going to happen to you because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. Number two, to seal up the sin. Now, that could have several different potential meanings. It, it could mean bring sin to its fullness, which would parallel the first statement. Or, as Smith explains, the perfect sacrifice for sin offered by Jesus the Messiah, provided the means by which the sin problem of mankind could be dealt with decisively. Number three, to make atonement for iniquity. The necessary sacrifice would be offered and would become the basis upon which iniquity could be forgiven. In Messiah, there is redemption, the forgiveness of sins. His once for all sacrifice is able to make perfect those who accept it as their own. In other words, we don't need another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another sacrifice. He paid for our sins once for all. And as we turn from those sins and repent and look to God, we're cleansed and we're forgiven. And it's something ongoing that we receive as we turn to God in repentance, re 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 receiving the benefits of what He did once and for all. So that works. Nothing being stretched, twisted so far to make it work to bring in everlasting righteousness. It is obviously God who brings in this righteousness and he does that through the Messiah. This righteousness by its very perpetuity must belong to the age of the Messiah. In other words, that when Yeshua died for us, he now established God's righteousness so that those who believe in him are pronounced righteous by God and are made everlastingly righteous by God. And ultimately, oh yes, ultimately we will see the fruit and the benefit of this through the entire planet. As every knee bows to him and every, confess, every tongue confesses that he's Lord and recognizes and honors him. But I, I look at these as a follower of Yeshua and say, yeah, check, 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 check. That makes sense. To seal up the vision and prophecy, literally vision and prophet. On two occasions, Yeshua cited the prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6 through 10 regarding the obtuseness of his fellow Jews the sealing of vision and prophecy in their midst, the failure to understand that the long-awaited Messiah was ministering in their midst was one of the penalties suffered by the Jewish nation because of the hardness of hearts. Well, that's one way to look at it. 
Smith suggests another way, and, and I prefer this. Sealing refers to the fulfillment of prophecies in Christ. That the sealing up of vision and prophet and all the things God said would come to pass, all the things God said would happen, they happened. They happened just as he spoke. They came to pass just as he said they would. Sealed it up, brought it to fulfillment. And then lastly, to anoint the most holy. The expression could refer to the anointing of the most holy person, the anointed one par excellence, or, of course, it could refer to the anointing of the temple. So, several ways to interpret that. It could mean that Yeshua, by his presence at the temple, brought a certain anointing. It would be an unusual usage, but it's possible. It could mean that he anointed a, a new temple, a spiritual temple, a spiritual people. It could mean that. Or the Hebrew, even though it normally speaks of, normally speaks of the place, the temple, the locale, it can actually speak of the Holy One, the high priest being the holiest one of all. It could be ref referring to the anointing on his life that he was then anointed as the great high priest who makes intercession for us, who dies for our sins. So either way, we could argue about a nuance of this part or this part. But I can give you a legitimate explanation as to how each of these six points is fulfilled in what Yeshua does on the cross and what he ushers in and the transformation of life that he brings. And then the second temple is destroyed. There it is. There it is. And if not, put the Messiah out of this for a moment. How is it fulfilled? What does it mean? Now, uh, Professor John Collins reflects a critical historical interpretation of the verse. And he says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression. It means the idea is that evil must run its course until the appointed time to bring sins to completion. As in Daniel 8.23, where their meaning is that the sins will reach their full measure and to expiate iniquity. Uh, with God as subject, the root le caper, with God as subject means to cancel or absolve to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal vision as authentic and to anoint a most holy place. The reference is to the rededication of the Jerusalem temple, which was actually accomplished by Judas Maccabee late in 164 BCE. The only problem with that is, is, is to, to think that iniquity is expiated and everlasting righteousness brought in and prophecy and vision sealed and, and sin brought to, to its full measure when Judas Maccabee rededicates the temple in 164 BCE. How does that work? It doesn't work. So the critical historical interpretation falls short. The traditional Jewish interpretation leaves us very, in very vague, uncertain waters. But the Messianic interpretation, clear, powerful, and fits. And that's why without shame, we endorse it and hold to it. And, and frankly, frankly, I, I do not make this into a major point of contention in terms of, as I said, terminus a quo, when does the prophecy start? dividing of the weeks, although I have no problem with it being 7, 62, and 1 in terms of those divisions. No problem with any of that. Debating over exactly how the last week unfolds and, and what happens, is that referring to the Romans and Titus making a covenant, breaking a covenant, and so on. You debate all that. I just see where it ends and what has to happen before it ends with the second temple standing. Let me just come back to this last phrase, to anoint the most holy. As I explain in volume three of my series, this is perhaps the most difficult phrase to explain with reference to Jesus. However, since the first five phrases can so readily be explained with reference to him, it seems only logical to see if this phrase too could apply to him. Wouldn't you agree with that as a method of interpretation? If my understanding of, of points one through five, five out of six makes sense and is clear, shouldn't I see if I could make sense in the same way out of point number six? Doesn't it make sense? Um, According to Gleason Archer, this is not likely a reference to the anointing of Christ, as some writers have suggested, because Kodesh Kodeshim, nowhere else in Scripture, that's holy of holies, most holy place, it, nowhere else in Scripture refers to a person. Here the anointing of the most holy most likely refers to the consecration of the temple of the Lord, quite conceivably the millennial temple to which so much attention is given in Ezekiel 40 to 44. In other words, it speaks of something yet to come. So once again, this would push the fulfillment of this event to a, to a future period where the seventh week, uh, the 70th week, this final week, is, is 
off in the distance as some Christians read it. I, I don't because it seems it has to end with the destruction of the second temple. In fact, it seems clear. Uh, but, but, but what about Archer's point that Kodesh Kodeshim, most holy, never refers to a person? Well, First Chronicles 23, 13, it may well refer to a person, as James Smith pointed out. So it's true that most translations understand this verse to state that Aaron was set apart to consecrate the most holy things, yet there are other translations, both Christian and Jewish. For example, the New American Standard Bible and the Orthodox Jewish Stone Translation that interpret the Hebrew with reference to Aaron himself. Aaron was set apart to sanctify him as most holy. So this could well refer to Yeshua being sanctified and set apart as most holy. If this is an accurate understanding of the Hebrew, then there would be biblical precedent for taking the most holy to refer to a person, not just to a place in the temple or to items in the temple. And to what person could the anointing of the most holy better refer than to our righteous Messiah, our priestly king? As far back as the 18th century, German scholars cited Nachmanides, Ramban, as having stated that, quote, the holy of holies is not else than the Messiah, the sanctified one of the sons of David. So in my view, then, we, we ultimately have, have two ways of looking at this. We could see that all six divine declarations found in Daniel 9, 24, apply to the work accomplished through the death and resurrection of the Messiah, and thus everything is fulfilled by the year 70. It's also possible to argue that on the basis of our Messiah's atoning work, that he had to bring this to pass before the second temple was destroyed, that there will then be a final future fulfillment with the implications of this, but I don't see that as necessary. Let's go back, though, and end this lecture with Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45a. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Now, let's go back to what Rashi says. Bear in mind, when I quote rabbinic interpreters, it's not to say they believe what I believe, nor am I trying to twist their words. I'm trying to say, look at what they're saying. Look at how they're trying to grapple with this. Look at the point they make. We're told we're the only ones who see it like this. Sometimes they see it like this. Look at what they're looking at. Here's a better way to look at it. So, according to Rashi, in the days of those kings means in the days of these kings when the kingdom of Rome is still in existence. Now you could argue, well, the remnants of the Roman Empire and European Union, or, uh, the Roman Empire itself has ceased to exist for many centuries, and historians would recognize that. In the days of these kings when the kingdom of Rome is still in existence, Rashi says, Scripture, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Rashi explains the kingdom of the Holy One, Blessed be he, which will never be destroyed, is the kingdom of the Messiah. So again, the kingdom of the Messiah, which starts as just something small and grows and grows and grows until it destroys all these other kingdoms and powers. It's a spiritual kingdom that grows and spreads through the earth until it's fully manifest with God's power and God's righteousness on the earth. Those are my words, not Rashi's. He says, the kingdom of the Holy One, blessed be he, which will never be destroyed, is the kingdom of the Messiah. And when does it begin? When the kingdom of Rome was still in existence. It will crumble and destroy all these kingdoms. So the Messianic kingdom was established in the Roman era, just as the New Testament writings declare. And it has been growing and increasing around the world ever since. As Daniel explained to the astonished Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, while you were watching, a rock was cut out. Daniel 2. 34 and 35. A rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. You see, we've had this understanding of the Messianic era that one day the Messiah will be revealed, could be among us today, and he'll be a great teacher, 
and he'll lead the Jewish people back to obedience to God's Torah, written and oral according to Jewish tradition. And, and then he'll fight the wars of the Lord and he'll regather the exiles and he'll rebuild the temple and, and establish peace on the earth and destroy the wicked and so on. And, and, and there it is. Well, Yeshua, when he returns, will fight the wicked with the breath of his mouth. Yeshua, when he returns, will bring the final ingathering. Yeshua, when, when he returns, will establish peace on the earth. But, but you see, the, the, the prophets spoke of a process through which this would happen one in which the Messiah enters our world and does his priestly ministry before the second temple is destroyed, rejected by his own nation, yet becoming a light to the nations, and then the knowledge of God spreading through the world until the whole earth hears of the message of God, and countless millions, even billions, are transformed by the message of Messiah. And then, when the final rejection of God's ways comes along with the final acceptance, great light, great darkness, the heels of that Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom. Everything's right on schedule. And the mission began right on schedule before the second temple was destroyed.